much. Thank you for that warm welcome. I'm honored to be here with you. I'm grateful to be here on the land of the peoples of Treaty 6, and I'm humbled by the leadership of Dr. Marie Wilson and Stephen Kafke that was present this morning. When I came home from the Truth and Reconciliation closing ceremonies, it was a bit of a full circle moment for me because I had been at six of the seven national events as ecumenical witness. And people asked me how it was, and I found it difficult to find the words. I had some writing and speaking to do, but I just kept putting it off. And a friend had asked me to reflect personally for a publication in the United States, and I got to the point where I could delay it no longer, and so I sat down to try to write something, and the tears came, and I thought they would not stop. You see, I abhor, but I have categories for a government's national project of assimilation, what the commissioners called cultural genocide. I understand power and greed, and I can put what my government did in a context of horrors that other governments have done to their citizens around the world. And I abhor, but I have a category for individual criminal acts of abuse against children. It's unspeakable, but we do have words for that. But what I was struggling with, what was bringing forth these tears of frustration and shame and anger and sadness was about my church, how each of the four churches could have collaborated with governments and abusers in the profound harm of generations of children. How could my faith, how could our faith, have motivated such profound wrong? And these were my theological questions, my soul struggling questions. How did we who claim we know what's sacred break the bond between parents and children? And how did we who say we can recognize the dignity of each person made in the image of God replace names with numbers and bury children in unmarked graves without notifying their families? And how did we, whose God is love, humiliate children or tell them their beloved family members were of the devil? And how could we, who are called to bring good news to the oppressed, enact such terrible oppression in the name of that good news? Christian people participated in what some call systemic evil by trusting in their own benevolence. And we did it in the schools, and we did that in the broader process of colonization. What ideas brought us there, and what will stop us from ever doing it again? There is, of course, no definitive answer to these questions. But I think a clue lies in what you're being asked to repudiate today, and that is the doctrine of discovery. What are we talking about when we use that phrase? The doctrine of discovery is the premise that Christians have a moral and legal right based on their religious superiority to invade and seize indigenous lands and to dominate indigenous peoples. At one level, the doctrine of discovery is church teaching, and it can be traced to a series of church documents, papal bulls, such as those of 1452 and 1455, that called for non-Christian people to be invaded, captured, vanquished, subdued, and to have their possessions seized by Christian monarchs. Another in 1493, by Pope Alexander VI, emboldening the explorations of Columbus, said that non-Christian, barbarous nations should be subjugated and proselytized for the propagation of the Christian empire. These papal bulls are what you could read as the doctrine of discovery. And the convenient rationale, indigenous people's so-called primitive nature 
meant that it was acceptable, preferable for them and their lands to be put under the hands of Christian monarchs of the explorers that discovered them. So on one level, the doctrine of discovery is Christian teaching that provided moral justification to imperial territorial claims. But on another level, the doctrine of discovery is law. In 1823, the U.S. Supreme Court gathered this moral justification and codified it into secular law. It was a ruling that gave the U.S. ultimate title over all the lands within its claimed borders. And this ruling has been cited repeatedly in Australia and New Zealand, in Canada, and in U.S. courts as recently as 2005. It's the basis for assumed sovereignty over indigenous lands. And a related part of this legal rationale, particularly used in Australia, was the idea of terra nullius, or the concept that the land was empty, or at least it was empty of civilized people putting it to civilized use. So on another level, it's church teaching, but on another level, it's law. It's about legal right. But perhaps most importantly, the doctrine of discovery is a set of ideas. That to be European and to be Christian is to be superior to indigenous people, such that it's only good and right for them and their lands to be subjugated. And that this domination, if it results in the conversion of indigenous peoples, is for their best interest. As the TRC report points out, the foundational view is that indigenous peoples should be colonized for their benefit in this world or in the next. These are the concepts that enabled the churches to collaborate in the residential school system and to continually pour Christian fuel on the colonial fire. Twisted benevolence wrapped around dehumanization. It, it's what has allowed actions to flow from churches and people of faith that were theologically and morally repugnant. And so it's fair to say that was then. What about now? Indigenous peoples call for the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery because they see that not only the legal framework, but these core concepts of superiority and dehumanization are still operative in their daily lives. They see European worldview continuing to be made normative, to be sustained in law, while their cultures, traditions, and perspectives many of them that are deeply prophetic in light of our current ecological crisis are trivialized, demeaned, and indigenous rights are invalidated. Now, I had the privilege to sit recently in a circle of indigenous people who were preparing for ministry in the United Church of Canada. And I asked them how the doctrine of discovery is still felt. And they had many answers. They spoke about how they continue to be defined by the Indian Act, about how governments are privileging the rights of corporations, in mining and fracking, negating land sovereignty of indigenous people. And they gave examples about questioning their capacity to be ordained, or how it seemed like only the colonial hymns were the sacred ones. And they talked about racism that was a part of their day-to-day. -day. The residue of the doctrine of discovery is evident when people say they can't handle alcohol, you know, or they just don't know how to take care of their children. When the risk of violence for Indigenous women is far greater than it is for me. And when in churches we think but maybe don't say they're just not quite there yet, out of this sense that Indigenous peoples are aspiring to be us. In repudiating the doctrine of discovery, we're being asked to reject historical church 
teachings and legal precedents that are inconsistent with the gospel and the inherent dignity and rights of all people made in the image of God. But we're also being asked to examine any places in our churches and in our communities and in our countries and in ourselves where these ideas might still stick and to disown them in favor of ideas and commitments and actions towards reconciliation. And this is not just about a one-time resolution, but about a life of continued reflection, ordinary spiritual discipline and witness. The repudiation of an abhorrent church history is challenging. We have to own up to our own collective complicities as Christians. But the transformation from ideas that might linger, especially when we may not even be aware of our collusion with them, this is harder. And for me, it helps to have companions who challenge me, people who I can wrestle it out with, people who have concrete ideas. And in that light, I'm just going to show you a short video where some folks in Kairos are reflecting on what this transformation towards reconciliation might mean. And then I'm going to invite a brief conversation for you to challenge and inspire each other together at your tables. That was dramatic. So we see the video, and uh, then after the video, we'll put up the questions. I always tell my, my grandchildren that they're going to be the real beneficiaries of the Truth Reconciliation Commission because there was no such things for, for me, no such things for even my daughters who were born in the late 70s and early 80s. Hopefully it's a new world that is starting where people uh, appreciate the contributions of the First Peoples. There's no way to reconcile the past without having justice in the present. Reconciliation means clean water and good schools on reserves. It means healthy, affordable food for people in the north. It means safety for Indigenous women wherever they go in Canada. It means Indigenous peoples determining their own futures. Every Canadian needs to know about the legacy of residential schools, the history of colonization, but also about the gifts and strengths of Indigenous communities in Canada today. Every Canadian should know whose traditional territory they live on, what treaties cover the area, the languages, traditions, what's happening there today. It's about living respectfully as a settler or a newcomer, as a guest. Our partners in Africa, Asia, and Latin America understand the challenge of reconciliation. They face their own painful histories of colonization and conflict. Our global partners are offering us solidarity in this moment, and that's what we need. For me, reconciliation is something I work at every day. For me, it's a commitment to change attitudes and behaviors. We need to work at this together as a nation, committed, respectfully walking towards right relations. We should always ask, does this proposed policy or action lead us away from or towards reconciliation? Reconciliation has to be felt in Indigenous communities. And we're not there yet. There is still racism, injustices, inequities there are still suicides. A better future for all of us depends on reconciliation being felt in every Indigenous community in Canada. We have nothing to fear if we take the initiative and make the effort to right our relationships because there is goodness in everyone and there's misunderstanding, but that if we are afraid, then we're allowing that part of ourselves to hold us back. We need to let go of those fears and move forward looking at how can we live in this land together, honoring each other, respecting the rights of each one. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to put up the questions now and to take just a, a brief time. We're time constrained 
But the two questions I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbors and your, in your table groups and, and to consider is, where do you see the doctrine of discovery continuing to operate? And what does reconciliation mean to you? We had some ideas shared with you there. So just a beginning conversation of 10 minutes or so.
interrupt on your conversations. I know that you could keep talking about this, but we need to honor the time. So I'm going to call you back to attention now, and I hope that you will be able to continue these discussions over coffee and beyond. And I turn the floor back to Jennifer. In any call to repudiate, we must ask, what, what are we going to replace it with? And I think the answer lies in the <coughs> renewal of the treaties and in the implementation of the UN <coughs> Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now, the earliest of our peace and friendship treaties were said to reflect elders' visions of a shared life together in mutuality and respect. National Indigenous Anglican Bishop Mark MacDonald said they were about making relatives of one another. Dr. Wilson spoke of them as sacred covenants. <coughs> Our chronic violations in treaties have been settler failures and betrayals in our covenantal responsibilities. But remember the words of Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah wrote against a backdrop of failure and despair, speaking of a new covenant that could be written on people's hearts, describing a transformation of the human heart so great that people would be enabled to keep the covenant. It would be essentially unbreakable. Now the courage of the survivors has given us the truth, and through that truth the only possibility for a new and reconciled future. It's our turn to respond with contrite hearts, to repudiate past doctrine, to reject the ideas that linger and to claim a future of hope and commitment. So let us begin to renew those ancient treaties, to write them on our hearts, to change our lives, to fulfill the obligations and responsibilities of a shared life together. We heard Dr. Wilson speak of the Commissioner's affirmation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as the framework for reconciliation in Canada. We can read this doctrine, written by Indigenous peoples, not a doctrine of discovery, but a doctrine of recovery, of dignity, of rights. As we reject the doctrine of discovery, let's embrace the UN Declaration as a context for our theological reflection, as a new legal framework, and as principles to guide our ways of thinking, and therefore our ways of acting. Might the Declaration be that unbreakable covenant that can guide our way to a shared future. In Kairos, we walk together. And I know that I need your hopefulness and your commitment when my heart is too unsettled by what we have done. And I hope that I can offer my faith and witness when you get weary. As Bishop Susan reminded us, the commissioners showed us the mountain and called us to do the climbing. And on your tables is a booklet it's giving you some very concrete help as individuals and churches. It looks like this. It's about strength for climbing. Some very concrete steps for how you might begin to enact reconciliation in your communities. And between Canada Day and Thanksgiving, we're encouraging every Canadian to read the summary report, to pray the 94 calls of action, to own this truth with heart and mind so that it will not be another report sitting around the shelf, but a wake-up call for the whole country. And at Thanksgiving, we're going to announce a bold new campaign, Winds of Change, that will focus on sustained public education, the calls to mandatory curriculum for schools, but also for newcomers to Canada. Curriculum about the history, but also about the critical contributions of Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples. Through Kairos, I hope the churches can be travelers on a common road, seeking reconciliation, praying the calls to action, renewing covenants with one another, with indigenous peoples, and more than anything else, sustaining hope that despite our brutal past, we can be different. We will be different. 
The most humbling reality of all is that after everything that's happened, for the most part, Indigenous peoples continue to offer gracious welcome and seek our partnership in a just transformation of this land. To that humbling invitation of true reconciliation, an expression of profound grace, how can we refuse? I would ask you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, forgive us for what we have done and what we have left undone in our country's journey with Indigenous peoples. Our failure to live up to the treaties, to live up to the dignity of all peoples, to live up to your dreams of justice, have created a deep rupture in our nation and a deep wound in our hearts. Bring us a change of heart, a renovated will, a deepened resolve for a renewed and hopeful future. With your enabling and empowering love, help us to begin to live in honor and mutual respect. Write this covenant of right relations on each of our hearts, and through the power of your spirit, make it an enduring bond of love and justice. In the name of the one who loved every person, every creature into being, we pray. Amen.